week I had the blessing of attending the Central Oklahoma Clergy Gathering. They have different groups around the state that meet like this. And this was my first time to fellowship with this particular set of clergy. I was the newbie, but I wasn't the only one. There were several newbies in the bunch, a couple of which were interrupts. Transition is such a consistent part of the church these days. I think if there's anything consistent, it is that we will be in transition for a very long time as the church, as our church. I was proud to be from Southern Hills Christian Church as I gathered with the other clergy at the regional office. And you'll excuse me as I keep messing with my microphone and tinkering with the bulletin and trying to figure out what's going on here and keeping us within an hour. You know, we uh, pastors um, and congregations have to figure out the right dance. And sometimes we have to do more than one dance. And sometimes we step on each other's toes. And let's hope that always in this context we are gracious partners. Amen. Amen. I was proud to be from Southern Hills as we gathered with this other group of clergy at the regional office. It was life-giving. It was a blessing of fellowship. It was a blessing to fellowship with, among other clergy, our own Lisa Wynn. We learned valuable information on church business like the upcoming leadership conference here in Edmond. It's next month. It's the first Christian church. I hope and I expect we will represent well. And the upcoming General Assembly in Des Moines, which we've already heard about. At both of these events, our General Minister and President will be present. We also heard about some some potential grant possibilities for any number of ministries. So if that makes you think of something, please see me and... um, We'll see what we can do. I'm sure sorry about this. So prior to the clergy gathering, I drove in down into downtown Oklahoma City. I chose, apparently, much like my mother, to drive all the way down eastern to MLK Jr. before finally moving over into the major thoroughfares. At 7.30 a.m., traffic was purring along at a glorious big city pace. Remember, folks, when you've been in the desert 18 years and you find yourself in the midst of an oasis, even rush hour traffic is something for which to give thanks. It was about 8 a.m. when I pulled into the parking lot of Sunnyside Cafe. This was joyous for so many reasons. None the least was that I was going to have eggs. Glorious eggs for the first time in a week. This was a big day. Going back to real food. Seriously, though, it was also, and more importantly, a preordained time to meet a former youth and now friend. Forrest was in the first week of his second session as an Oklahoma state legislature. Like most friends, along, like most lifelong friends do when seeing each other after having had some time apart. We greeted one another with a smile and and a hug, and in no time at all, we were catching up on our lives, our families, our shared relationships, our shared interests. Toward the end of our breakfast, a person he had recently met, I'm not sure there's many he hasn't met, stopped by our booth unannounced and sat down. Naturally, our greetings and conversation quickly turned to how I knew, how we knew one another. And I had become accustomed to saying, Forrest is a former youth. But before I had the chance, Forrest volunteered. This is my good friend, Rob. He baptized me back in the day. Our newly arrived breakfast companion looked at me and asked, Baptized him into what? (laughs) The water, I said. The water. The rest is for another day. As a minister anticipating writing a sermon on Jesus' baptism this very week, Forrest's baptism statement pecued my ears and I wondered how I would be able to work that story into our sermon time on Sunday. 
think that's an important thing to do as I feel we all need practice sharing the stories of our faith. That's why I very much appreciated Steve's story this morning on offering. We have to become comfortable and uh, observant in our own lives for the ways in which the Holy is present. For a former youth to remember his baptism without promise, without prompting, this week seemed in many ways spirit-led. At least that's how I chose to frame it. Would you, would you please pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be holy and acceptable to you. O oh God, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer. Amen. Matthew begins chapter 3 with Jesus as an adult, which is serious time travel in the Gospel of Matthew. There is no encounter in the temple like the one we shared a couple weeks back from Luke. There is no Jesus as an 8-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 14-year-old, or a 16-year-old. In today's passage from Matthew, Jesus is an adult. We have no idea what may have preceded this time, but we, but we do know that Matthew uses John to quote scriptures from Isaiah saying, the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness sure does sound and look a little strange. Clothing of camel hair, with a diet of locusts and wild honey. I guess even then, fashion statements and fad diets were a thing. <coughs> Biblical research teaches us that indeed such garb was common for that of prophets, and for the audience of that day, these cues cued them into John being a representative of Elijah, representative of Elijah which was good enough for them because they came out in droves. The scripture says, Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan and were baptized by him into the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Well, that's an uplifting word from the gospel. The warm-up to Jesus' baptism is John blasting the people. But especially those more closely associated with roles of leadership that day. John is preaching fire and brimstone and he ain't pulling no punches. It seems clear by the reading that John, in total prophet mode, tells the people to repent. And from the, when we look at the word repent there, we know it means to change or to, to, to turn. John says repent because the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of heaven coming near is, of course, in this particular circumstance, the arrival of Jesus. Jesus is the kingdom of God come near. And because the kingdom of God has come near, the people are invited to respond by changing their ways and moving closer to God. This, packet, this passage is packed with select selections which we can take apart for days on end, rightfully so. But today the part I ask us to reflect on is how we respond to the kingdom of God or to the kingdom, as we like to say around here, of God coming near. But the way this story of our faith in, is told informs we readers that repentance or turning or changing is possible because the kingdom of God has drawn near. See, we often think of our repentance as something we come to on our own. But today's scripture seems to have this, this slant, this perspective, or at least I'd like us to consider what if our teaching today says that our repentance is in response to an invitation. 
So if the kingdom of God has come near, how has that changed us? How are we changing? The call of repentance in Matthew 3 is made possible as a result of the divine work to bring the benevolent reign of God to bear in the world. God in flesh, Jesus, Emmanuel, is the kingdom of God come near and people are presented an opportunity to respond. That's how it is in the stories of our faith. That's how it is in our life. Divine interventions, or I'm sorry, divine initiative has always preceded and been the basis for human response. Isaiah tells us, return to me, for I have redeemed you. Understanding and pursuing repentance and really all divine invitations as response versus initiation frees us up from being the masters of our faith to being grateful recipients. Do you hear and feel the difference? As Soren Kierkegaard expressed in expressed the initiating word of God by saying, when we awake in the morning and turn our thoughts to you, you are the first. You have loved us first. Even if I arise at daybreak and instantly turn my thoughts to you in prayer, you are too quick for me. You have loved me first. God loved. God loves us first. How we live is our response. The story of Jesus is rooted in the story of the captive Israel. In this case, especially with regard to the life of Moses, Moses and Matthew's Jesus were both born at a time in which God's people were oppressed by hostile forces. Moses by Pharaoh in Egypt and Jesus by Herod in the Roman Empire. As babies were both potential victims of the oppressors, both of their stories include miraculous displays of God's power. In a moment of passing through the waters, Moses at the Red Sea, Jesus in the waters of baptism. They were both tested in the wilderness and each gave their authoritative teaching from a mountain. Moses, the giving of the law from Mount Sinai, and Matthew, Matthew's Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. We will see in the next few weeks as we look at the Gospel of Matthew up through Easter that these parallels to Moses are an important element in Matthew's portrayal of Jesus throughout the narrative. Of course, a key difference in the narratives of Moses and Matthew's Jesus is that in Moses' story, Egypt is a place of danger and oppression from which the Israelites flee for the Promised Land. For Jesus and his family, there is safety in Egypt when the promised land becomes a place of danger and oppression. The Bible has story after story of God's people moving around and story after story of the importance of extending hospitality to strangers. The stories of persons displaced from home go hand in hand with the stories of God's people extending hospitality to the widows and the orphans and the strangers. We cannot both claim Scripture informs the way we live and refuse to extend hospitality and compassion to immigrants and refugees. We cannot claim to follow the way of Jesus a brown-skinned refugee, while failing to welcome our brothers and sisters from Syria, Central America, Mexico, and other countries, plagued with poverty, war, and violence, most of whom have experienced things we cannot imagine. 
Jesus chose to be baptized not because he was a sinner, but to be in solidarity with his community. For Jesus, doing the right thing meant being in right relationship with God, which was inseparable from right relationship with neighbor. Jesus wasn't the first person by any means to be baptized. Many different groups in the ancient world used ritual cleansing as a part of the religious observation. John the Baptist himself was a respected prophet who was baptizing people as a sign of the repentance from sin. So Jesus wasn't the first, but when he stepped forward to be baptized, he gave new meaning and life and permanence to an old symbol. Part of that new meaning was evident when it was Jesus who came forward to be baptized by John instead of the other way around. You notice John's reaction with Jesus when Jesus came to the water. It caused something of a crisis for John because he felt that Jesus should be baptizing him. When Jesus stepped forward to be baptized, John immediately thought, I'm not worthy. It's you who must baptize me. Jesus was the one prophesied about. This would have been especially true in their culture. It was rigidly hierarchical. Everyone knew their place in society and in government and in religion. There were the conquering Romans on top and the conquered people of other nationalities below. Of course, the emperor was at the very top and those in his circle just below. Society spread out to various other lower layers beneath that. Literally, part of your survival depended on you knowing your place. Knowing your place compared to the people around you, you could get into big trouble if you did not. So when Jesus came down to the water to be baptized, John knew that their position should be reversed. Jesus was of a higher status. And for Jesus to be baptized by lower status, John would be to dishonor Jesus. But Jesus said, to fulfill all righteousness, I must be baptized by you. Gosh, we could go off on a whole other sermon on righteousness and the way Jesus sees it right there. But you're like, Pastor, you've already had two. But that's what happened. Jesus stepped into the water and the water that represented chaos to so many. He stepped out again alive and clean and ready for service. And as Jesus got ready to step out, the heavens opened up and he received God's Blessing for service. A dove appeared. The very same sign Noah had at the beginning of his whole new world after the flood. How appropriate. With the beginning of Jesus' mission, it was a whole new day. Jesus of higher status had taken his place among those of lower degree. By God's will, the hierarchy was flattened. In what was the most reckless way, God had come to live among mortals. The teacher was baptized by the student and blessed to serve. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. As followers of the way of Jesus, ours is the call to seek to be like Jesus to understand that we are beloved, that we are enough, that we are chosen. God is willing, ready, and able to bring new life into our fragmented world and so desperately wants our help to bring the kingdom a little closer. Amen. You will note that today we have only sung two hymns, and this is going to be the second. It's a seven verse long hymn. That's why we're only singing two songs this day. This is a time of invitation where if there are those in our midst who would love to come forward and transfer membership or confess their faith, I would be glad to receive them on behalf of the community. It's also a time of preparing ourselves for communion at the table where, of course, all are welcome. Let us stand and sing, I was there to hear your voice. <laughs>
This is the place to which we come each week to remember who we are and to whom we belong. This is the place where we are blessed and reminded that we are holy and we are commissioned to take that blessing into the world. For it was on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed that he took the bread and he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. In similar fashion, after they had eaten, Jesus took up the cup, poured it out, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and take this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we heard Rob's sermon this morning talking about Christ's baptism, I can't help but think about my own baptism. It was a night in the 1960s. In Christmas Eve, my brother was in Vietnam, and I was fortunate enough to have my father baptize me on Christmas Eve night. And I'm thinking how special and lucky it was for me, and I'm grateful for the role model of my father in my life. And God, as we stand at this table, we're grateful and thankful for the role model of your son that you sent to earth to teach us how to be in this world and how to love others. Help us to go forth from this place loving as you taught us.